everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our, uh, well, every other week, a virtual roundtable where we talk about all things having to do with the Beatles, their past, their present, their future. I'm actually an alumnus of, uh, of the show. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from uh, Beatle Fan Magazine, and they drag me out here a couple of times a year to... Uh, to kind of help out and uh but in lieu of having the place to myself actually i'll introduce the a- the actual co-hosts of things we said today uh first of all the uh the host of the uh syndicated radio uh radio show uh every little thing and he's also one of the co-hosts of the uh, of the video cast talk more talk and uh, what am I leaving out? Anyways. That's enough. <laughs> okay. And he, he's Ken Michaels. Hi, Al. Good to have you uh, back. Ah, uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And then our, uh, our resident musicologist, the, the longtime, what would you say, Beatles desk um, aficionado at the New York Times, but in, his, in, in reality, his, uh, uh, he was the uh, longtime classical music reviewer at the Times and still, still uh, does some work for the Times as well as for the Wall Street Journal and various other publications. And uh, these, as I said, the resident musicologist here, and it's Alan Cozen. Hey, Hi, Al. Alan. How are you doing, Al? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Absolutely. And, uh, and then uh, another longtime radio, uh, radio pro. He's been a, a fixture at WFUV for uh, 38 years and um, uh, still does uh, also um, uh, still does along with his nightly programming, still does some uh, Saturday afternoon programming as well. And uh, and it's uh, it's Darren DeVivo. Hello, Al. It's hey. great to have you back. And yeah, I'm, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm just a little rusty. <laughs> We're Not bad, though. Rusty. You don't even have a cheat sheet. <laughs> yeah. yeah no. really. I could have sworn Dan earlier? Ingram was in the room. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Al. Great to have you uh, on board with us. Uh, Thank you, sir. Show. Appreciate it. And it's great to see, actually, hear you, Ken and Alan. It's always great to hear you, Darren. We'll yes, have to get yeah. to see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> My, it might happen. Yeah. And since uh, since I know that uh, now the the format here has changed a little bit from when uh, uh, from when I was here, so uh, the uh, the first order of business is to get to the Beatle news for the week, and for that I will f- pass it over to Ken Michaels. Okay, thank you, Al. Uh, we should just say that the main topic. For the show, we're going to be talking yes. about Phil Spector because of his uh, passing just a few days ago, a legendary producer at the age of 81. And so we're all going to be talking about uh, Phil Spector's career and in particular uh, his work with the Beatles and the solo Beatles. We'll do that in a few moments. But first in Beatle news, over a week ago, Olivia Harrison revealed on Instagram that she had been hospitalized in London with COVID-19. But she says she's on the mend. And in her post, she showed her sense of humor, saying that she was redesigning the hospital room curtain. And in her post, showed a curtain tied in a bow. And she added the words, gratitude to all the selfless carers. Olivia is 72 years old now. So let's all keep her in her prayers and hope for a speedy recovery for Olivia Harrison. Just recently, an interesting tape leaked out online called George Harrison Cassette Sessions which had short excerpts of songs with George on acoustic guitar. And the website Beatles Liverpool Location says that the tape was recorded circa May 1970 when George was visiting his parents at the Clatterbridge Cancer Center in Whirl, where George's mom, Louise, was being treated for cancer, for which she eventually died on July 7th that year. This tape has now been removed from YouTube by the RIAA. It includes songs that appeared on George's album, All Things Must Pass. Other unreleased songs from that time from George, like Everybody Nobody, Window Window, and Mother Divine. Even Paul McCartney's Come and Get It, 
it is rumored to be something we might get, might, on the forthcoming All Things Must Pass archival box set. But one can easily think that this was a very personal tape considering the serious situation at the time with Louise suffering from cancer. This article also says that this tape first appeared on the legitimate All Music website where there was a recent copyright dump of around 100 All Things Must Pass tracks, which they assume were put there to secure the legal ownership before the release of the All Things Must Pass box set. The cassette audio was registered with the YouTube copyright ID, which suggests that these recordings are either being considered for the upcoming box set or that if this tape has fallen into the wrong hands, that the Harrisons want to secure their legal rights to the material. Mm -hmm. Some of the other songs on there, George does We're Gonna Move, which is the Elvis Presley song from Love Me Tender. Also a few Bob Dylan songs, Lay Lady Lay, Mr. Tambourine Man. Also something called Gotta Get Out of Bed, You Lazy Bugger. <laughs> and uh, I have heard this. It's a very informal tape. They only played about maybe 20, 30 seconds of each song. And there's a little banter in between each song. I would find it hard to believe they would release this, especially considering the bootleg of Beware of Apco and the, the superior quality audio-wise of that. But who knows? Any of you guys get to hear this? Yeah, I heard it when it was on the original site that you mentioned. They had 30 seconds of each song. And, you know, so it was quite a lot longer than this 12 minute YouTube and uh, quite a lot more stuff. Basically, it had 30 seconds of everything on it. And it was like maybe three CDs worth. Wow. So, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it sounds really good. And it, it, there was originally that theory that it was a, a copyright dump, although I, I'm not sure that this meets the definition of publication. If you put only 30 seconds of a song out, you know, and not make it available in any way, unless you happen to have caught the, the very brief time it was up there. It may, I don't know, but uh, I, I suspect that they weren't doing it just for that. It, 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 it looked like it was, um, in the original listing, it looked like it was going to be the stuff that was going to be on the, uh, the, the All Things Must Pass box, but, you know, who knows really. Great stuff, yeah. though. I'd love to hear the, you know, the, I mean, a lot of it has never been bootlegged. There are quite a number of things, and... Uh, uh, so this is a, a sort of a must for 2021, I think, getting this thing out in its entirety. Mm. Oh, there's a I've lot of hits is, on it. Uh, all I've heard is like 30 seconds or so of Come and Get It, mm -hmm. which was, you know, fine from what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, like you, if George you is in me. the room with you, this is what it would sound like. Very, yeah. like I said, very informal. Right. You got me beat, Al, because I haven't... And had a chance. I didn't get a chance to listen. I just kept forgetting to to go locate the link. And now Ken mentions that it's been taken down unless it's been captured by somebody else and put back up. But uh, were the um, did it seem, Alan, that the songs were not professionally, but were they kind of faded in and out, thirty second snippets, or were they just rough edits and cuts? They were sort of edits and cuts, basically. Yeah, from what I had heard, there's a lot of hiss on it, yeah. but I'm sure they could clean that up. Mm, sure. Mm. All right, in other news, Paul McCartney's latest album, McCartney 3, has dropped mightily on the Billboard charts after debuting at number two. It then sunk down to number 37, and this week stands at number 90 on the top 200 album charts here in the U.S. And after debuting at number one in the U.K. on their official albums charts, then dropping to 19 and then 38, it's now completely off their top 100 album charts. Hmm. Pretty much the same thing as what happened with Egypt Station. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. wait till they put out the uh, Roulette Wheel edition, which is going oh, to have... God. <laughs> it's oh, going to have oh, two God. more bonus cuts. <laughs> And a lot of trinkets and uh, a roulette wheel. Uh, okay, don't don't give him any ideas. But uh, I'll, I'll I'll need some MP3s from you, Alan. Okay. And the uh, the expanded edition will have uh, chips. 
that you could use. You don't That's get the right. chips with That's... the standard roulette wheel box. Yes. You and... ought to be working for Paul. Two of you. And maybe a deck of cards, too. Mm. <laughs> do, we, do, do we give them the little silver ball to use on the wheel, or do they have to wait till a Christmas mega box? Yeah, no, I think that's the Christmas mega box for uh, end of 2021. It's, uh, it, it also comes with a croupier. <laughs> you can choose male or female. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Oh, boy. No comment. Nothing would surprise me at this point. <laughs> anyway, more news. A brand new documentary on the untold story of Abbey Road Studios called If These Walls Could Sing is now in the works, directed by Paul McCartney's daughter, Mary, and to be produced by Academy Award BAFTA and Primetime Emmy Award winner John Batsek, known for his work on One Day in September, Searching for Sugar Man, and Eric Clapton, Life in 12 Bars. This follows a new development deal between Mercury Studios, that's the Music First content studio from the Universal Music Group, Batsek's company, Ventureland, and Mary McCartney brings her own unique perspective to this documentary, saying, Some of my earliest memories as a young child come from time spent at Abbey Road. I've long wanted to tell the story of this historic place, and I couldn't be collaborating with a better team than John and Mercury Studios to make this creative ambition a reality. If These Walls Could Sing marks the first time Abbey Road has opened its doors to a feature-length documentary and will be the centerpiece of the legendary recording studio's 90th anniversary celebrations, which begin in November this year. It will tell countless stories featuring an all-star cast of interviews, unparalleled access to the studios, and of course, a spellbinding soundtrack. Makes mm -hmm. me wonder, uh, I'm sure Paul will be involved, hopefully Ringo. Be nice if uh, either of them contributed something. Yeah, for I mean, a soundtrack. hey, Bit Boppers recorded there. <laughs> you know, between <laughs> from uh, from the from Peter Jackson's movie to that documentary that McCartney uh, has done or is doing with um, Rick Rubin, and now this, there's lots of great stuff coming down the pike uh, here in 2021 into 22. That's true. You know what I meant to bring up is that earlier we had heard that there was a documentary in the works on McCartney that was to cover all of his solo career culminating with the Glastonbury Festival of last year, which obviously didn't happen. And I'm wondering what happened to that documentary? Or is this something that Rick Rubin is now a part of? Is it a continuation of what Paul's already been working on? No one's been bringing that up because there was some attention given to that. And now you don't hear anything about it. Right. I think the Rick Rubin one is probably a separate thing. I mean, it, it reads like it's, part of something else for some other kind of series. So I, I, I doubt that's what that one was, but um, I don't know. I guess uh, they, they may be uh, waiting for a, a suitable finale, you know, like Glastonbury would have been. And, you know, they have time, although, you know, presumably they'll want it for Paul's 80th. So uh, they'll have to make a decision hmm. at some point. Okay. Well, that's that's really interesting. Two documentaries on Paul at the same time. Mm. You know? Mm. All right. Uh, more news. Only a few more items here. Um, in cover versions, there is a new cover of the song Arrow Through Me from the band Scary Pockets. And this group has been around since 2017. They are described as an R&B, soul, and funk band. And they post a new video of a song that they perform every week. This band has an ever-changing roster of personnel. And two weeks ago, they posted their video for Arrow Through Me with Madison Cunningham as their lead vocalist. Pretty good job of the song. She's cool, Madison Cunningham, by the way. Oh, where do you know her from, Taryn? WFUV. Yeah, we played oh, her really? solo record. Yeah, she's, she's pretty cool. Oh, okay. Don't ask me to hum anything or I don't remember, but I just... <laughs> what, what what I've heard of her album, which I have a uh, solo album, was I, I enjoyed. Okay. It's an interesting cover because there's no brass on this arrangement, but um, the guitar player plays the, the riff that you hear a lot, that the brass do, mm -hmm. on the song. Okay. 
with special thanks to John Bazzini of the Beatles in Print Together and Solo Facebook page. Available so far only on Kindle on February 16th, Richard Perry um, is putting out a book. It's called Cloud Nine, Memories of a Record Producer. For Beatle fans, we know him for producing Ringo's two albums, Ringo and Goodnight Vienna. But he's produced so many more artists, great artists like Harry Nilsson, Carly Simon, Barbara Streisand, Art Garfunkel, Diana Ross, and many others. And hopefully Tiny there'll Tim. be much more than Tiny Tim. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Which God album? Tiny, Tiny Tim. Tim. He, he, he okay. Produce that album. Okay. <laughs> we got to get an interview with him. We'll just focus on Tiny Tim, though. <laughs> and... Uh, our longtime friend, Chris Engelhart, is back. The author of the books Deep Undercover and Deeper Undercover. His books have explored the many side projects of the solo Beatles. He will have his final book out on the subject coming October 1st this year to be called Beatles Fully Undercovered. It's an updated version of his first two books. And he's done outstanding work in this field. And uh, I can only tell you, going back to one of the most influential books for me altogether now, the discography from Wally Pedrazic and Harry Castleman, that's where I developed an interest in side projects on the Beatles. It kind of started from there. And in the book, you would find out songs that the Beatles produced for other artists or wrote for other artists or played on for other artists. And then Chris just carried that with him and put all these books out on that very same subject. And it's a whole other world, (laughs) knowing what the Beatles contributed for other artists in different capacities. So uh, great work from Chris, and I can't wait for that one to come out. And uh, I guess it goes without saying that finally, we are hoping to hear very soon, supposed to be this month, about the upcoming Plastic on All Band box set. Let's keep our fingers crossed for that. Because we did hear 159 tracks will be on it. And uh, so sometime this month, we should be hearing something. All right. So I'm very happy to say, I haven't said this for a while. Back to you, Al. (laughs) Back off. Okay. (laughs) Like I said, I am very rusty. (laughs) Haven't done this in a long time. Okay. Uh, as uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, they uh, they dragged me out here to uh, because of the uh, the passing over the weekend of uh, of Phil Spector. It, it's uh, it's a strange thing. I think there's uh, there's kind of a dichotomy of opinion for people my age. We uh, you know we can appreciate Phil's work, especially his work from the '60s and uh, and early '70s, while also having to uh, you know uh, balance that uh, that thin line between his 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 professional work and his uh, shall we say eccentric lifestyle. And uh, whereas I think with people that are say Darren's age or or younger, uh, I think they they mainly think of him strictly as you know this eccentric who spent the uh, the last decade of his life uh, in um, as a as a, a guest of the of the state of California um, for murder. <laughs> So where and then oh yeah and he produced some records in the early '60s, so there is that that kind of uh, dichotomy of opinion. Uh, it's very strange, actually. Um, in I, 1961, so 60 years ago, was the year that I kind of really kind of discovered rock and roll, and among the my favorite records of that year were. Benny King's Spanish Harlem, uh, Ray Peterson's adaptation of the folk tune Karina Karina, Curtis Lee's Pretty Little Angel Eyes, Under the Moon of Love, uh, the, the Paris Sisters, I Love How You Love Me. And then that fall, uh, The Crystals, There's No Other Like My Baby. And I didn't know until years later that all of those songs, all of those records were either uh, were either produced or co-written by Phil Spector. So that that gives you an idea even before 
uh, setting up Phil S. Records with Lester Sill, uh, what he was what he was capable of as a as a producer. In fact, I want to uh, actually bring Professor Cozen in here because he <laughs> because Spectre in the in the sixties talked about his production work as being like little symphonies, uh, little symphonies for the kids, and talked about how how he deliberately tried to give his productions a Wagnerian tone. Hmm. And so Professor Cozen will explain to us what he means. <laughs> I don't really hear it that way myself. Um, I, I think um, he's trying to go for, you know, some classical references to explain the sort of grandeur of the sound he was after, you know, that whole wall of sound thing with, you know, multiple overdubs to create, you know, not just the sound of like a little backing orchestra in a studio, but like a massive really wall of sound is the perfect way to put it, you know, mm-hmm. um, which wasn't just a matter of having lots of instruments. It, it really also had a lot to do with reverb and other effects that he used to magnify the ensemble that he brought into the studio or overdubbed multiply in the studio. And, uh, you know, and it became a, a signature sound. I mean, uh, you can you can listen to certain things that if you've never heard them before, you would know that they were either a Phil Spector production or someone imitating a Phil Spector production. So that, that's the, the only thing I can say about the Wagnerian thing. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a little and typically grand of him to say that. I mean, he, when he went to his, um, when he went to his court appearances, he went with that, you know, bizarre hairdo, you may remember, Mm -hmm. and, and said that what he was getting at was he wanted to, when the judge saw him, he wanted him to think of him as a combination of Einstein and Beethoven, you know? So, he uses classical music references interestingly, but the, you know, it's, it's more, um, I think just for the feel of it rather than the, you know, actual, uh, influences. That's my theory. And since you mentioned the, uh, uh, the ensemble, uh, that he worked with in the studio, maybe you should expand on that since, you know, those are some of the great session people of all time. Um, right. And we'll be talking about the wrecking crew. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, we've mentioned the Wrecking Crew a, a number of times over the years, including in the days when you were a co-host. Uh, it's you know Hal Blaine and um, oh, what's her name? The bassist Carol K. Carol uh, K. Uh, Carol and uh, you know these are yeah these are people who in in the L.A. scene were you know the session musicians, and they were on gazillions of records that we know and love and Phil Spector used them all the time. And, um, but you know, not for everything. I mean, obviously when he, uh, when he went to London to do his thing to the let it be album or mm. all things must pass or imagine or classic Ono bandit, you know, obviously he didn't bring the wrecking crew with him, but you know, if you listen to something like be my baby, I mean that, that sound is the wrecking crew. And it's also him, you know, it's the Wrecking Crew sounded differently for other producers and other people because they would do what a producer or an artist wanted, you know, they they would just, once they had the idea of the kind of sound that someone was looking for, they could produce it. And uh, they would have known if they were looking, if they were working for Phil, the kind of sound he wanted. Um, And so they contributed mightily to it. But it was still, you know, fundamentally his sound, you know, he shaped it, he created it, um, even if they did the actual execution of, of, of the notes. Well, exactly. I have a question. I want to ask you something, yeah. Al. Mm-hmm. Um, since many of these records that were hits, I heard as a very, very young boy, but I remember I hearing was just about to ask you about on, that. <laughs> on, on the radio, but... You know, I just enjoyed them as records. I don't recall, you can enlighten us, whether or not on the radio, on Top 40 Radio, were all these artists, was Phil Spector's name mentioned all the time with them as though they were just as much the artists as he were? He, no. as he was? Because 
his his contribution was so massive to those songs, you only heard the artist names. Mm-hmm. Because the, Absolutely. the first time, I felt, yeah. as I said, the, like those records from 1961 that I liked so much, I probably didn't know for another decade that Spectre had, had produced them. So when did Phil get all this respect and recognition? Was it much later on? It was it was much later on, uh, much later on. In fact, actually, he probably he had more recognition within, you know, within the business. Like, for instance, in 1966, when River Deep Mountain High became a huge hit in England mm. and yet peaked at, I think, 88 or something like that in uh, uh, in Billboard uh, and and Spectre in a fit of peak quit the business. Uh, that was a big deal within the industry, but as far as like you know the average fan, it was pretty much who cares, mm. you know. And so it really wasn't until uh, probably really wasn't until he came he came back in 1969 when he uh, signed a deal with uh, with A and M. Uh, production deal and did a couple of records with the Ronettes, but also did Black Pearl by Sonny Charles and Checkmates Limited. Uh, that it was like, oh yeah, that's the Phil Spector sound. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, so he Good wrote job. a lot of those songs, so his name would have been on the records as a, in, in a writer yes. credit. Mm-hmm. When the Beatles went to New York for the first time in 64, Spectre flew over with them and they knew the all floor, about yeah. who he was. So, um, you know, within the music business and within among musicians, he was very well known, um, probably Absolutely. less yeah. to us as consumers, you know, mm-hmm. unless, you know, rabid collectors read labels and the Beatles were rabid collectors in that sense. They, they, they were always conscious of who wrote what. And so, you know, they would have known, they would have known him from that. And, uh, you know, in, in uh, Michael Braun's Love Me Do, I think, uh, there is part of the discussion between Paul and Phil Spector on that flight over with Paul asking Phil Spector, you know, what are they going to, what are they Americans going to want from us? They have everything, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. um, there was also, I don't believe it was in that book, I believe it was in Ronnie Spector's memoir, uh, um, some chat about them hanging around the Plaza Hotel with her sitting on John Lennon's lap and uh, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's one of the stories. That's one of the stories. That's one of the stories. Well, I think John has mentioned it too uh, in somewhat different detail, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, they all, the the Beatles got to know the Spectre worlds in 64, basically. And actually, uh, after, after he hits the flight over, during February of 64, uh, he made a couple of records that, or produced a couple of records, that were, uh, that were in fact Beatles related. One of them was a cover of Hold Me Tight, you know, from Meet the Beatles, uh, w- with a uh, a duo they called the Treasures, hmm. who were actually a, a couple of of uh, singer songwriters and session uh, session players for him. Uh, one named uh, Peter Andreoli, Pete Anders, and the other was oh. one Vinnie Poncia, hmm. who of course is in small world. Become, yeah. Yeah. And then the other one was a um, much better known record called uh, Ringo, I Love You right. by, uh, by mm-hmm. one Bonnie Joe Mason, which was, you know, a more accessible name than uh, than back t- to this day. I've always had problems with being able to pronounce Cher's last name. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but um, she was. And, and and going back, I mean, we can go back to the to the Hamburg days and the Deco audition days when they yes. did to know her is to love her, um, mm-hmm. or which was originally to know him is to love him, <laughs> and so you know that that might have been their first encounter with Phil Spector as a, as a composer. I'm not sure. I but, think uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. I just find it fascinating that the Beatles were so into songwriting credits and production credits and being aware of that stuff so early on they were paying attention to it 
You know, with me, it, it wasn't until my teenage years when I really looked at all that stuff. But just the whole idea of a superstar producer, you know, even in the 60s as a kid, when I heard Beatles records on the radio, I didn't hear George Martin's name mentioned all the time. But it seemed like in the 70s, the first major name, well, after buying Let It Be, the album, but I would hear Phil Spector's name quite a lot as though he was the first superstar producer in rock. Would that be an accurate description? Uh, I suppose to an extent, although uh, by that, certainly by that time, you had to uh, throw Brian Wilson's name in there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly. And and which is, you know, interesting since Brian was not really a protege of Spectre, but certainly very much an admirer. Of his, I mean, I think to this day he says that, you know, "Be My Baby" is his favorite record of all time. Right, and you have Shadow Morton was sort of big too, not as big as Phil Spector. Yeah, that's true. But Darren, I wanted to ask you: When did you first encounter, at least, the name Phil Spector? It was, um, I mean, his name was always there, being that. You know, I was five years old in 1970, which I point out fairly often on this show. Um, mm-hmm. So Spectre's name, Spectre was always a name that was there, and it was already an established name in my mind. It's quite possible seeing it on the Let It Be, uh, the Let It Be album. But I really started to learn about Spectre. I think, I don't recall the year it came out, but the Back to Mono box set was yeah, right was, 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 was was sort of you know, how I really sunk my teeth in to uh, what he had accomplished, what he did, who he had worked with, who these bands were, you know. Uh, but he was always, it was always a name that I was familiar with as far back as I can remember. At the time, you know, that Let It Be came out, he was about to go on to that, what would you say, uh, kind of like that second uh, second phase of his career the, with the uh, his classic 60s uh, production behind him. So um, it was just a name that was always, always uh, prominent for me. So I would think that by by uh, 70, by 69, 70, especially with Let It Be, the album, you know, Spectre started to, uh, you know, his name kind of went up in lights. One other thing I wonder, the, uh, the his Christmas album, of course, his iconic Christmas album, mm-hmm. which was initially called uh, A Christmas Gift for You from Phyllis Records, but I think was reissued later on in the decade as a Christmas gift for you from Phil Spector. I could be wrong about that after the Phyllis label went, went uh, closed down. And of course, Apple reissued it. I think Apple was the first label to reissue it as Phil Spector's Christmas album. Exactly. Would you say that that also kind of played into building his name up Uh, the, the Christmas album, especially the re-release when they changed very much the title so. very much so in fact i <laughs> i spent 25 dollars for a copy of the original album at uh, i think it was the house of oldies in greenwich village right. uh probably around 1969 or 70 and uh, you know it was like a year later that apple reissued it as right. like as you as you just said as the Phil Spector as the Phil Spector Christmas album. And you know, actually I, one of one of the in fact I think one of the future reissues of it was in stereo, which was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember hearing about that and I don't know I don't know if I've heard that uh that that stereo mix because um I'm trying to think now I often I've learned so much about what I like and about just general music knowledge. That all for me really was like going to college was when I went to college and started working at WFUV back in the day. It was a college station. And, you know, the first thing that really grabbed me, and this would have been in late 1983, early 84, was the music library that WFUV had which was like a treasure trove of encyclopedias for me. I just devoured all these records and and learned about all these different artists. And that's when I sort of, that was probably also when I started to really get down to nitty gritty of learning what Phil Spector had done 
and uh, found out that uh, Apple Records had re-released, uh, had issued uh, that iconic Christmas album. And then there was numerous reissues after that. One of them, I think, was the stereo uh, mix that you're talking about, Al. I think uh, there was a few labels, Pavilion Records, Passport Records, one or two others that uh, every year or every other year, a different label was getting the rights to that record and reissuing it. But uh, I remember reading about the stereo mix being pretty uh, inferior. Definitely. Absolutely. The uh, the first effort in Inspector's production work with any of the uh, of the Beatles was, of course, uh, Instant Karma. The, uh, the 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 first the first kind of mainstream pop pop single by John Lennon. And uh, Ken, when uh, when did you first hear that? Around the time it came out. Okay. In our early 19, 1970. And. I loved it <laughs> instantly, <laughs> but my mind didn't automatically think of Phil Spector. I love the production right. behind it, yeah. but yeah. you know, that's, it, it's interesting. You're bringing up the Christmas album of Phil Spector because now whenever I hear those artists like the Ronettes and the Crystals, my mind automatically goes to Phil Spector. It's almost like, you sure. know, that's so much a part of their identity. Yeah. And I think that might be a turnoff to some people because for those that feel that a producer's job is just to bring out the best in the artist, but not to put too much of themselves in it, you know? Well, I mean, I'm I, well, not saying that that was, I, I, that that was the case, but, you know, I'm just relating that to a lot of what's going on today where certain fans, like I've brought this up many times on this show, uh, are, fans don't want a producer to put so much of their signature sound or their influence in, into the artist themselves to the point where the artist is kind of lost in the producer's vision, you know? Yeah. I don't and, know when that happens, but I think, you know, like I that. think you're thinking of Al can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think you're thinking of the artist producer relationship in more conventional terms than Phil Spector thought of it as for yeah. Phil Spector, you know, when, the Ronettes or the Crystals or any of these groups were going to have a session. It was a Phil Spector session, and he brought in the singers he wanted to sing. It's not as if these were sort of groups that existed on their own and Phil Spector right. produced them. Phil Spector brought them together, had which singers he wanted, and you know, record for record, he would make it and it would have a name on it like the crystals or the Ronettes, but it was really just the Phil Spector hit factory. Exactly. I believe that Darling Love was more of a uh, session vocalist for Spector. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, well, and, in fact, was... the, the good example of that is that uh, the, the crystals third single on Phil S records was called, was a, uh, Jerry Goff and Carol King song called he hit me and it felt like a kiss. <laughs> and a lot of, a lot of radio stations wouldn't play it because it was, you know, what, in fact, it's funny because it was recorded, it was recorded around the same time that they recorded or that the cookies recorded, uh, recorded chains and Richard Williams in his book, uh, in the early 70s about Spectre was speculating oh, what was going on in the uh, Goffin and King household in, uh, in 1962. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of the fact that, that radio wouldn't play uh, that, you know, he hit me, Spectre then came up with a, a new crystal single, but <laughs> without the crystals. It was actually Darlene Love, as, as Darren just mentioned, and um, her group, The Blossoms. And mm -hmm. the, the, the crystals, the actual crystals, were not involved in He's a Rebel at all. So, in fact, there's, you, there's some YouTube clips of, um, uh, of the crystals, of the, the quote-unquote real crystals, uh, lip-syncing uh, He's a Rebel. On you know I don't know Shivery or whatever uh, you know top forty uh, dance show and uh, you know none of them were on the the original record so mm -hmm. that's that confirms what what Alan was just saying 
Let me just, uh, can I just jump in here? So, Al, going back to what you said at the beginning, in the 60s, early to mid 60s, as all of these hits that Phil produced, one right after another, were coming out from a variety of artists, at that time, the artists' names, Crystals with the Ronettes, et cetera, Mm -hmm. they were front and center. They were what you were thinking. They were what you were looking for when you went to the record store. I want to get the new Ronette single. And this right. and, and the producer, Phil Spector, was not the prominent name, but that would change in time uh, as Phil Spector's name uh, was put up in lights. It almost revealed that when these recordings were made, it was a Phil Spector session and oh the who sang and you know what band or whatever was almost an afterthought. But mm-hmm. that's not what the public was aware of when these were brand new releases. Am I right? Very, absolutely. Very much like what was happening at Motown in the very early days, where basically Barry Gordy, Smokey Robinson, Norman Whitfield, and other producers really were uh, crafting the, the Motown sound. But and would have, it wasn't until much later. Now, of course, well, it's a little different because Smokey was a performer. But but it really wasn't until much later that the public became aware of uh, you know just of the you know the creation of the Motown of the Motown sound. And so it's very much the same with uh, you know with, uh, with with Spectre. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, they were, you know, if I went to a record store to get Walking in the Rain by the Ronettes, it didn't really, at that point, it didn't really register that it was, that it was produced by Phil Spector. Right. And you were going to the store to get the new Ronettes single. Exactly. Behind the scenes, unbeknownst to you, though, this recording was a Phil Spector production. And as time went by, the Phil Spector name sort of overtook who the performer was. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, by, you know, early, uh, early 1970, uh, Spectre was much more of a, uh, you know, of a well-known public name. Mm-hmm. And, and so then around, uh, I guess it was probably around February, just after he had recorded, after he had produced uh, John Lennon's uh, Instant Karma, uh, it was suddenly revealed that, uh, that Spectre was going to um, the, uh, do, the, do the production work on finishing up the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the Back to Basics uh, Beatles album. Uh, that had been languishing for nearly a year, and that seemed to be not exactly a match made in heaven. There actually is another aspect of this that is not that well known. Okay, so let's go back to September 20th. John Lennon announces he's quitting the Beatles, uh, and everything is thrown into disarray. Paul McCartney goes up to Scotland, when he comes down to Scott from Scotland in November, the first thing he had to do was have dinner with the other Beatles, except John, who was away, and Alan Klein. And at that dinner, I believe the date was November 18th or 19th, 1969, Klein proposed bringing in another of his clients, one Phil Spector, to put the Let It Be stuff or Get Back stuff as it was then into some kind of listenable order and, 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 and finish producing the album. So actually, he was brought into the Beatles world before Instant Karma was made. Um, but I think, you, you know, you're right, it was revealed after Instant Karma that he would be, uh, you know, then doing that album. But uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that he comes through Klein. And if you look at that back to mono box, that's an APCO, right. you know, thing. Exactly. Um, so, so there's a, another Spectre Beatles connection that, that isn't as widely known as, as you know, maybe it should be. But you, when you first heard that Spectre was going to work on Let It Be, didn't that seem to be kind of an incongruous uh, match? I don't know. You know, seeing as we 
thought of Spectre at the time it was announced as the guy who did all those great early 60s rockers, mm. not as the guy who would lather strings all over Long and Winding Road, it, <laughs> it seemed okay, you know, like it seemed a, a possibility. And then Instant Karma came out and it was, yeah, okay, so he might use some reverb and stuff, but it's going to be, a, you know, it's, it, it still could fulfill what the Beatles said they wanted to do. It was really only once the album came out that every, that you thought, oh my God, you know. What has he done? Yeah, what has he done? And, you know, and the thing is that when Klein brought it up, I mean, they, they all agreed, Paul included, that Spectre should do it. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but but Paul did make the proviso that anything you do with these things has to be run by us. And that was one of the things he was so upset about. It had not been run by him. The first he heard about it was when he got an acetate, you know, and listened to Long and Winding Road and, and said basically WTF and sat down and wrote a letter to Spectre and Klein saying, I want this stuff either removed or toned down. I want the Beatles instruments more prominent and ended the letter with don't do it again <laughs> <laughs> when uh, alan alan and al when you got your hands on the let it be album in the spring of 70 early summer 70 and you listen to it how much of phil specter's presence hit your ears and and did you react to it or has your reaction to specter's production uh, your opinions of it been formed in the years following the album's release. Hmm. Do you want no. to take that first, Al? No, I won't watch you take it. Okay. Okay, <laughs> keep in mind, I, I don't know about Al, but I suspect that Al's experience was similar to mine in the sense that we had heard the bootleg of Get, the Get, Get Back stuff long before yeah. the Get Back album, came, the Let It Be album came out. And so we <laughs> knew what Long and Winding Road was supposed to sound like. And we had heard oh. the original version of Across the Universe. You know, actually, for as much as those two songs, from my point of view, uh, or his treatment of those two songs, ruined the album <laughs> to a large degree, if you think about it, he didn't do that to too many songs. I mean, there's orchestration on Let It Be, there's orchestration on Long and Winding Road, uh, and on um, Across, the, Across universe. the Universe. I, but, I, I mean, I, yeah. but, you know, his other thing that he did, turning the one minute, three second performance of I Me Mine into a full length track, was really not a bad edit, you know, that was, that was pretty good work. And the other stuff, apart from those few songs, is really pretty straightforward. I don't think he did an awful mm. lot to it. So in a way, we've been kind of unfair to him. And in a way, those few things that he did had, I thought, a really negative effect. I mean, when I heard Long and Winding Road the first time when the Let It Be album came out, I thought, well, what happened to this song? It was just a quite nice little song with the Beatles playing a kind of laid back backing to Paul singing it. And it was fine. And now it was just a big slathery mess, much as I like yeah. orchestras. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually, I really didn't have much of a problem with the uh, the orchestrated uh, Long and Winding Road, especially since it... Um, it was released as the the second American single uh, from the album, and this was after Paul had, you know, in Complained. effect left the group yeah. and all. And it appeared, at least at that moment, that that was kind of like the end of the story of the group, at least. And uh, and so it was also it was almost like a punctuation mark on their uh, on their career. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, the public, I think, wasn't caught up with the whole history behind this album to the degree right. where yeah. that song was a number one single in the yeah. U.S. as it right. was, you right. know, and I didn't I don't remember people complaining back then about Phil Spector's production on the album or the single. It I just did. it was a success. <laughs> yeah, I remember people complaining so, about it, including me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
to this day, I, I prefer I, I prefer his the Phil Spector produced album, you know, and uh, I love what he did with the Long and Windy Road. And as we've mentioned here, Alan, the arrangement of the song came from someone else. Yes, that's Richard right. Houston. That's and right. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever blames him. Everybody picks on Phil Spector, although he oversaw the whole thing. And apparently there were no hard feelings between Paul and Richard Hewson because he went on to work on Thrillington with him. And so why things. is it nobody ever brings that up? Yeah. Yeah. He also did some work on um, a, a few tracks on wildlife. Yeah. And I think um, Hewson has said that he and Paul never, ever discussed Long and Winding Road. Um, you know, but he knew that Houston had been hired to do a job and he did the job he was hired to do. Um, it, it didn't have to be as, you know, it, it still is Spectre because Spectre did the mixes, Spectre did the balances. It was up to Spectre how loud the orchestra was. And, uh, mm. you know, Spectre, uh, Spectre may even have dictated the orchestration in a way. And, and one of the things that Paul especially objected to in his letter of complaint was the use of harps and choirs. Right. Um, he really disliked those. And, uh, you know, but as far as the, you know, to, to, to support what Ken is saying in a way, in a certain way, Paul's live versions of Long and Winding Road, even yes. though he has sometimes switched to brass instead of strings, is, you know, very similar to the, to the Spectre arrangement. Doesn't have harps and choirs, but, but still, you know, he, he, there may have been something about the arrangement that he did like. He just didn't think it was... Um, he didn't think that the the production on the album was... We're, you know what? The, actually, really, the main thing that may have gotten him apart from the harps and the, and the choirs is that he had said, you got to run this by me, and no one ran it by him. And I think that was also a very significant part of his objection. And, and you yeah, could use even the... As... But wasn't there also a deadline because they wanted the album out in time for the film? Yeah, but there was enough time to remix that that one track if if they had been willing. But um, I think Klein was unwilling, and I think it probably I think Klein probably liked the idea that that Paul didn't like it. <laughs> mm. and, and and I also suspect that it was Paul's vehement objection to that recording that may have played into Klein's decision to release it as the, the next American single. Yeah. Um, sim- so that just so that, you know, every time Paul turned on the radio, he'd have to hear it, you know, but I may be projecting. <laughs> but it is interesting that as far back as 76, when he, uh, when he performed the song on the, on the Wings Over America tour, mm-hmm. uh, as Alan was just saying, uh, there is a, you know, at least a, a subtle resemblance between uh, the version he did live and the, and the, the, the specterized uh, version. But, um, uh, Ken, something I wanted to ask you about, because recently you've been talking about, as both here and on Talk More Talk, uh, you've been talking about the fact that a lot of people these days are, uh, uh, are, are really trending uh, much more toward stripped-down versions right. of, of, of recordings. Right. So, uh, so especially since after Let It Be, you have now about what I guess about two years or two two and a half years worth of uh, of, uh, of work that Spectre did with uh, with John Lennon and and George Harrison. Mm. Yeah, right. I know. And you know you're seeing this trend, like with the "Give Me Some Truth" compilation remixes, mm-hmm. not so much remasters, but remixes too. And we're going to see a remix of "All Things Must Pass," and you know. I've often said it's just another alternative, another way of listening to it. But mm-hmm. I never had a problem with any of the mixes. I'm all for remastering. I'm all for cleaning up uh, the sound and uh, hearing the separation of instrument instruments better. But the balance of all the instrumentations, I would want to keep the same. I mean, that's the way that George approved it back then. And I know that right before he died, he was even thinking that it, a lot of the production was way too heavy. 
That's what he was mm. thinking about right before he passed away. But even at that time, that's what he approved. And the whole world didn't have a problem with All Things Must Pass. It was a blockbuster album hitting number one for a triple album, which cost more money. <laughs> you know, so I don't think the world was in any way complaining about Phil Spector's production then. But I just think that sometimes there's not enough respect given to the initial success of a record like All Things Must Pass, the way it came out, or The Long and Winding Road, the way it came out, because just by witness of the charts, you can't get any better than number one with a number one single or a number one album. And like I said, you could put out all these different remixes all you want. It's fine if you want, you know, a lot of different options, but I'll never have a problem with the original mixes. To me, the original mix of Long and Winding Road was the one that came out on the bootleg in, you know, 1969. <laughs> yeah. And true. also, John and Ringo at the time, when Let It Be came out, didn't have a problem with it. And John was praising Phil Spector, you right. know, saying he, did, he made the best of these shitty recordings. Right. You know, I don't recall what George said. But he must have liked what Phil Spector was doing if he was going to work with him for all things must pass. Right, exactly. Right. exactly. You know, I think yeah. I I think the you know what you said about um, no one having a problem with all things must pass at the time, and 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 that's true. And you know, I also I agree with you that that if they remix it, it'll be an alternative, not a replacement. Mm. But I think that when people's attitudes began to change about you know, well, maybe the album all things must pass is a little bit muddy and a little bit overcooked was exactly when the bootlegs you know beware of abco and 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 that whole bunch of bootlegs of all things must pass in progress came out and people began to hear that wait a minute you know with just a basic band this is kind of nice um mm -hmm. and i think that made people curious about a despectorized remix not necessarily as a replacement, but just to hear what a small band playing that stuff or, or how George imagined it, which is um, what we would get if they put out that uh, acoustic set that you had mentioned in the news. Mm. Well, yeah. the, the Beware of Abco is a whole other world, just yeah. acoustic demos compared mm -hmm. to a full band arrangement. Mm -hmm. I'm all for that. And I have no problem, like I said, with remixes or a stripped down All Things Must Pass. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as Al has said, and it's something we share in common, I'm a song man first. And the reason why this music is held up the way it has is because they're great songs first. Right. And the production will always matter. It'll never matter as much as the songs. But it's hard for me to imagine All Things Must Pass any other way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess, you know, the poster that came with All Things Must Pass of George in front of that stained glass window, mm -hmm. it, it, for some reason, that has stuck with me every time I think of, of the album, because I think of, you know, a cathedral, you know, what would a band with all these great musicians sound like if they were in a cathedral with all this ambiance and, and echo, and it would be, you know, pretty close to this, with the exception of the simpler songs like uh, behind that locked door or Apple Scruffs, those songs. And by the way, Phil Spector did leave the sessions like halfway through. So it wasn't all done by Phil. The simpler stuff, the simpler stuff, like the ones I mentioned, I think were done mainly by George. It's a huge difference between listening to Apple Scruffs and oh, most yeah. of the other songs on the album. So, uh, yeah, that's worth pointing out. It wasn't all Phil Spector. Mm -hmm. Darren, when you when you finally caught up with, well, particularly All Things Must Pass, but also uh, I should throw in Plastic Ono Band, even though that's a much more stripped down album, once again, uh, and Imagine, and, and even sometime in New York City, when you caught up with those albums, uh, did the, the Spectre production give you any problems or... And it's funny you read my mind now because I just was going to say, all right, well, what about the other things that Spectre produced? Um, mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think my 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 opinions of all of those uh, 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 records are uh, I've always looked at All Things Must Pass as being one of Spectre's great works because Spectre's 
production on that album really, and I totally agree with everything Ken was saying, uh, Spectre's production on All Things Must Pass really gave that album that quality that just put it over the top. This grand, um, for lack of a better way, putting a cathedral-like quality that uh, just just made All Things Must Pass extra special. On the other side of the coin, I've always felt that sometime in New York City sounded like a train wreck. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what went wrong, you know, with that album, whether it was the performance, the production, John's input into the production, or Phil Spector's input into the production, or was it... That was always one that um, I always... I never liked the way it, it, it sounded, and I thought it really, you know pulled down an already spotty album but when i heard those records for the first time i don't i don't i don't re really recall my immediate reaction to them it was just my reaction to sometime in new york city anyone could have produced it i wasn't paying attention to that but or all things must pass and not initially you know i think i was introduced to old things must pass my copy i think i got like around in the middle 70s Sometime in New York City, actually, was after John died. Uh, I, did, I had never heard that album from beginning to end. All I knew was the single from the Shaved Fish. But, you know, I, I'm thinking back, and I don't, I don't recall Spectre, his production really, my opinion of the albums really wasn't affected by uh, who produced it. I just had these opinions of, boy, that sounds great, and this sounds very sloppy. Could I, I add something? Really answered your question now, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know, I've spoken to Gary Van Syok about the album sometime in New York City, and I'm hoping to talk to him very soon to interview him again. But mm -hmm. Phil Spector left the album fairly early, and I'm pretty certain that the only thing he worked on was "Woman Is the Negro of the World," which sounds very much like a Phil Spector production. Is that and the really rest of the, I'll double check with Gary hopefully this week, but. Yeah, I mean, the rest of the album, there isn't any heavy wall of sound. But then again, Imagine is not heavy on yeah. Phil Spector's sound, and, and <laughs> Plastic Auto Band is as stripped down as you can get. You know, well, I mean, Instant yeah. Karma, yes, but, you know. Well, uh, I mean, there's a, uh, an interesting thing now was popping up here. I didn't, and if I did know this about sometime in New York City, I forgot about it. I mean, we, you and I, Ken, at Beatle Fest, at the Fest of Beatles fans, we've, we interviewed Gary Van Syok uh, t twice, I believe. And it may have come up in the conversation, and I don't recall, uh, that Phil Spector uh, wasn't really part of the entire recording session. And now, same thing with All Things Must Pass, that Phil wasn't involved in every aspect of that album. And then, of course, there's the question of how much Phil uh, had to do with the Plastic Ono Band album. Was it Ringo who said he never recalled seeing Phil around all that much in the studio. Uh, in, the, yeah. in the case of Lennon, I felt Lennon was influenced heavily. Uh, Lennon's production style by Spectre. Uh, and it was an influence that probably um, definitely predated the opportunity for the, uh, for, for the well, for the uh, opportunity for the two of them to work together. Uh, I've always liked kind of that kind of uh, muddy kind of dare i use the word sloppy production of mind games and walls and bridges i just feel like on sometime in new york city it was exceptionally uh slipshod sounding you know but that was you know maybe that was more lennon's doing right like on on imagine something like give me some truth i don't want to be a soldier um the production on there is which is it more is it more john's production or was it more specter yeah. production because i think that there's a lot of specter in lennon's style it worked on imagine and what mind games it for whatever reason didn't work on sometime in new york city in my opinion mm -hmm. and it's uh it, yeah, on sometime in new york city actually Probably my favorite track on the album is his Sisters Oh Sisters, mm -hmm. which you can really tell is a Spectre is a Specter production mm -hmm. because it's you know it's it's very much in a in a sense having Yoko be be Ronnie in yeah. you know in in effect. 
I you never thought of it that way. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned before that, uh, that there's, uh, I don't think it's in print uh, at all anymore, but there's, a, there's a, a great book about Spectre that came out in the early 70s called, uh, I think it's called Out of His Head. And which is interesting <laughs> when you get right down to it. And the the first chapter in the book uh, talks about, in fact, it was really, I think, the first uh, really detailed description I had ever seen of the session for Happy Christmas War is Over, which actually both John and, uh, and Phil went into thinking, you know, we want to make this into the kind of classic Christmas record that say white Christmas, whatever, mm-hmm. or, or in fact, the recordings that Spectre made for the, the Phyllis uh, records Christmas album. So, you know, how uh, the, um, over the years, obviously uh, it's become, it has become uh, a classic yeah, it's got such mm-hmm. a rich sound to it, such a full sound, especially with the the Harlem Community Choir. Exactly. I mean, everything about it as a production, I mean, as mm-hmm. a song, it's wonderful. But as a production, it's absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, And I think that, that that's a very big part of that record was the production behind it. And you got to give Phil a lot of credit for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that song and All Things Must Pass, I think, are the Spectre's crowning achievements when it comes to working uh, in the Beatles circle. Well, you know, I, I do think John was able to tone him down in most cases. Mm-hmm. It's not like if I listen to the Imagine album, it's not like I'm going to think to myself without knowing it. Gee, Phil Spector is all over this. I right. wouldn't know it unless I was told that I could see him working heavily on something like How Do You Sleep, for example. You know, a song with an orchestration like that. And Spector was kept in check in, in a big way with, on the uh, John Lennon Plastikono band album. Sure. Right. And, and Ringo, I think it was Ringo who said uh, he doesn't really recall Spectre being around all that much during mm-hmm. those sessions. Yep. And around the same time uh, as Happy Christmas, a little, little bit earlier, a couple of months earlier, uh, Spectre um, produced a wonderful single for uh, Apple Records single for Ronnie called, uh, called Try Some, Buy Some. With this wonderfully lush production, which uh, roughly two years later, um, <laughs> uh, George Harrison would, uh, shall we say, appropriate for um, uh, for his, I guess you could call it a cover of the uh, of, of of try some buy some, which a- appeared on Living in the Material World, but which used the exactly the same instrumental track Mm -hmm. it's a great recording and i love george's vocals on it it really works well for him as a song Mm -hmm. i think it was it was uh when i interviewed uh david bowie back i think he was promoting the reality album Mm. uh which is the album where bowie covers try some buy some and i asked him i said uh that's a fairly obscure george harrison song to decide to cover you know, decades after it was originally released. And I remember he was telling me he loved Ronnie Spector's version, uh, mm. which I thought was even more uh, interesting. I said, because, it, you know, Ron, I, I said to him, Ronnie Spector's version really didn't sell. Uh, I mean, where would you have heard it that it made an impact on you? And what would that have been? 1972, I think. And I think he said he had heard it that it was in a jukebox uh, that he was around or had access to and heard a lot. And didn't even know that a year or two later, George covered it. And it wasn't until many years after the fact that he heard George's version of it. But he was completely uh, smitten with Ronnie Spector's version and had that in mind when he recorded it for his album, Reality. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. And it wasn't too much longer after the uh, uh, after the, re- the the release of Living in the Material World that uh, that John Lennon, beginning uh, in the in the in the early stages of the alleged Lost Weekend, 
surfaced in in, in LA and um, and began work with uh, with Spectre on a uh, on a on a collection of uh, of rock and roll oldies, you know, some of his uh, favorite songs, where uh, where he basically said. I, you know, I, I just want to be the singer. I just want to be Ronnie. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> perhaps you guys can elaborate on how well that turned out. Yeah, you know, that was, uh, that seemed like it was, would be an ideal project. John Lennon singing oldies, mm-hmm. Phil Spector producing. That's an album that I like now a lot more than I liked when it came out. When it came out, I really disliked it, um, and here's why. Partly, um, uh, I thought that you know the wall of sound thing kind of didn't work for John quite as well as it worked for the girl groups. But it also seemed to be not quite the same wall of sound. It seemed to be slower and more turgid, and um, mm-hmm. and also you know when I heard John's doing a rock and roll album. I'm imagining all of these songs are going to be John in his like screaming rocker voice. And a lot Mm. of them were a lot more laid back than that, you know? Um, So, and I don't know to what degree Phil Spector suggested that or whatever, if it, if these were, these were how John was hearing those songs then, uh, as opposed to when they came out uh, and whatever it was. But to me, it, it didn't seem at the time like it worked. I mean, over the years, it grew on me, and and, and, and I kind of like the album now. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't wouldn't make it the top of my John Lennon list. But, uh, mm-hmm. but I, I, I like it a bit better. But also the sessions were, you know, all the stories coming out of those sessions in the years after, uh, you know, Phil Spector coming in with a gun and shooting it in the studio and, uh, <laughs> you know, and then taking the tapes and no one knows where they are. And then John gets a call from him whispering, I've got the John Dean tapes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, if you're John Lennon, you know, let's say you live a wild enough life as it is, but you're trying to get some work done and this kind of impeded it in a way, you know, not to mention that the rock and roll album, you know, partly had to do with with his settlement with Morris Levy for appropriating You Can't Catch Me uh, in Come Together. And so he had to get that album out to satisfy Levy, and suddenly Phil has the tapes. Levy has a cassette of rough mixes, which he puts out, you know, which isn't what John wants. And, uh, you know, so the whole thing was kind of a mess. And and I, I think that apart from the fact that John then retired for five years, I, that could very well be why this was the end of the Beatles individual and collective relationship with Phil Spector. Exactly. Yeah. This was also around the time of those, those uh, kind of strange collaborations that Spector was involved with outside of the Beatles started popping up like, uh, uh Leonard Cohen, Leonard mm-hmm. Cohen's death of a ladies man, uh, mm-hmm. Dion's album, uh, Born to Be With You, which didn't even mm-hmm. get released, I don't think, in the U.S. initially. And that kind of, on paper, makes, you could kind of say, all right, Dion and Phil Spector. Uh, mm-hmm. But what the type of music that Dion was doing in the early to mid-70s, and then all of a sudden he's got an album that Spector produces. Uh, you mentioned Leonard Cohen, and then in 79, Ramon's doing End of the Century. Yes. With, with Spector producing. <laughs> And I didn't even I had forgotten all about this, even as late as 2003. Spectre produced the British band Star Sailor, uh, which mm-hmm. I don't think I, I've heard that album. But still, I can only imagine. But the mid 70s that I think the Leonard Cohen pro- album is the one that really is uh, is I, I, I know that he uh, Leonard Cohen, from what I've read, was rather unnerved by Spectre's presence. And that so the album, Ramones. Yeah. <laughs> and if you if you got the Ramones unnerved, then you've really uh, <laughs> you know, then you're really. And, uh, and he did an album with Cher around that time as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hell. oh, to be a fly on the wall in the sessions for the end of the century album with the Ramones and Phil Spector together. 
Yeah, especially since he basically locked them <laughs> in, in, in his, I think, guess was his home studio. And basically <laughs> there was no way for them to get out. <laughs> it was uh, not, a, not a great experience for them. Too funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a, a, a quote from uh, Steve Van Zandt, uh, you know, about Spectre that, you know, he was a genius irredeemably conflicted um, and made yeah. made some of the greatest records in history based on the salvation of love while remaining incapable of giving or receiving love his whole life. You know, he was, you know, obviously a damaged person in some ways and, you know, not to make excuses for him for, you know, shooting someone in the face uh, and killing her. But, you know, there was something wrong there. You know, he had a level of genius as a producer that I don't think you can argue with. Uh, some of those records are just astonishing. And yet he just was so off the chart, you know, and ended up his life as a, a murderer in prison, you know, died in prison. It's, it's, it's in, in, in a lot of ways, it's a tragic story for, you know, quite a number of people. But it's something that, you know, as you said at the beginning, Al, it's, it's something people tussle with, you know, you know genius in a, a musical endeavor or artistic endeavor versus what the person is, you know, or what the person does outside of that. It's, uh, it's something that's, you know, vexes people. And, uh, Phil Spector, for me, I mean, I, I, this, this argument comes up an awful lot. Uh, you know, what about someone who, you know, supported, you know, like, like, like musicians under the Nazi regime who, you know, conducted or sang or, you know, performed for the Nazis? How do we feel about listening to their stuff now? And, and I, I think you really have to make the distinction between the person's life and the person's art. And you may feel a little uncomfortable dealing with the art once you know the full story of the person, but they are separate things, you know? I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, in, in, in a way, basically everybody has some aspect that if you were to dig into it, whatever, however great their work may be, there, there's, there's probably some aspect of the person that you would have trouble dealing with if you knew about it. It doesn't always, however, get to the, the degree of murder, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's an extreme kind of thing. And, uh, it's, uh, unfortunately that's an aspect of Phil Spector that he is known for now along with mm. his work. So. Yeah. Well, it's probably as good. Um, uh, Ken, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I, it's very difficult with people like Phil Spector or certain people who, like a Bill Cosby, somebody that I revered yes. for so long. Yeah. You know, I want to separate that person's work from the other troubles he had in his life, and I'm usually able to do it. But I understand why a lot of people can't. Mm. You know. Uh, there's nothing that will ever take away from the genius of what Phil Spector was with his recordings. And uh, as much as I've said, the song comes first, you know, you listen to the Righteous Brothers, you've lost that love and feeling. Oh. So much of that record, it's the production that makes it so amazing and their vocals. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, th there's so much that goes into those records and it's hard to imagine those songs any other way, mm -hmm. you know? So although that song, you've lost that love and feeling, you know, was a big hit for Hall and Oates, and sure. uh, but it's it's the most played song of all time on the radio, and I'm sure the Righteous Brothers version is probably the most played. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's uh, I understand what you're saying, Alan, and you know, I I often have arguments with people about this, you know, especially with Bill Cosby. I mean, I love this TV show, and I don't want what he did at the end of his life to ruin the enjoyment that I get from a, from his TV show and his comedy. And, and take it out on the cast of this TV show. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing for a lot of people. I, I definitely understand that for some. And, uh, but with, with Phil Spector, you know, it, it's the same thing with me. 
nothing will ever take away from the brilliance of what he did on his records. And I'm so grateful for the for the work he did with the Beatles and the solo Beatles. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's a yep. a good a good summation of the of the whole dichotomy of how people feel about Phil. Mm. Yeah. And I think actually I think the clock is uh is our enemy right about now, so I think probably it's time for uh, for us to uh wrap it up and uh you you guys can let us know why or what you're all doing and all the contact information, all the stuff that I that I forget about. <laughs> <laughs> we forget about it all the time, and we're doing it all, every two weeks. <laughs> so, uh, Darren, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you want to send me an email, you can write me at wfuv. My email address there is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. And uh, the name is D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. If you'd like to uh, listen to WFUV, uh, please do so. If you want to hear me when I'm on the air, Monday through Thursday nights, uh, I'm on 10 p.m. to midnight, normally under normal circumstances, which uh, hasn't been normal now for uh, almost a year. Uh, It would be uh, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., but uh, we're broadcasting. All the DJs are broadcasting from home. Everything we do is remote. So as a result of that, for logistical reasons, my show has been temporarily trimmed to 10 p.m. to midnight. That's Monday through Thursday nights and Saturday afternoons from uh, 1 to 4 p.m. If you're in the New York City tri-state area, 90.7 FM, uh, or for the few of you who might still enjoy HD, we're at 90.7 FM HD2. Uh, you stream us anywhere at WFUV.org. Listen on the app and ask your smart speaker to play W. No, demand that your smart speaker plays WFUV. And uh, I think it's actually, I think today or tomorrow is uh, for me like 10 months that I have been doing my shows from home. I haven't set foot. On uh, in the WFUV studios now for 10 months uh, as of today. It was around March 19th or March 20th and uh, we've pretty much been told uh, that we're going to be re- broadcasting remotely probably into the summer at least. So pretty weird, very strange times. Anyway, enough with me. Strange now. days indeed. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Next. Uh, I say Ken goes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll make this quick. My email address is everylittlething at att.net. On my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, I have weekly Beatles trivia on my Beatles trivia and games page where you can win one of 10 prizes every week. And I'm now giving away McCartney 3 on CD as a prize. So there's a, a different trivia question or game every week. Go visit the website, and you could be a winner. Um, This coming Friday, I'm going to be interviewed live on the Internet by Pat Matthews, who runs the Beatles-Arama All Beatles channel. They just started their own YouTube channel, Beatles-Arama TV, and uh, Pat is going to be interviewing me. They've carried my show, Every Little Thing, on their channel for many years now. So it's going to be everything Beatles I'll be talking about this Friday it's at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Go to Beatles Arama TV and subscribe to their channel. Uh, and also, I have uh, my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a video podcast. The next show will be this coming Monday. And we're going to be talking about, guess what? Phil Spector. And uh, we'll have a special guest for that one. And that's Jason Krupa who does the Producing the Beatles podcast. We were thinking about getting someone more on a uh, technological end mm-hmm. to to understand Phil Spector's contributions. So that's going to be this coming Monday. Go to our Facebook page, which is Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, if you haven't friended us yet, do so. And uh, at 9 o'clock Eastern, we have our live show, and you can write in and comment about the show and your thoughts about Phil Spector. And anything that we're talking about on the show. And then immediately after that, it's it's all over the place on many platforms, including YouTube. So if you can, uh, please subscribe to that channel for Talk More Talk, as well as our 
channel here of uh, things we said today. Oh, by the way, Kid O'Toole, who does the Talk More Talk show with me, I just did an interview with her for my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. Which and is excellent, uh, by the way. Oh, thank you. And I'm having you on, Al. You'll probably be my next guest. So that's going to be coming soon. Next picture. And <laughs> Don't look at it that way. It's realistic, <laughs> but don't look at it that way. <laughs> so uh, that's at Ken Michaels Radio. And if you can, subscribe to that one. And we're going to be talking about an article that you wrote recently for Beatle Fan about the afterlife of mm -hmm. the Beatles. The last 50 years and Beatles recordings and how well they've done and... Oh, how amazing the last 50 years have been for Beatle fans and keeping the Beatles out there in the public eye. And, you know, it's a whole other world, the afterlife of the Beatles. So uh, I believe that's everything. And uh, over to you, Alan. Professor? Okay. The easiest way to get me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can reach all of us at uh, email address things we said today radio show at gmail.com incredibly long name i'll say it again one word things we said today radio show at gmail.com we have a twitter feed at things we said fab and two facebook pages the main one from our point of view is things we said today beatles radio fans and there is also one that is just things we said today. We post the shows on there or links to the shows either on YouTube or Podbean. You can find the shows at YouTube, Podbean, iTunes or iPodcasts or whatever they are now. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're all over the place. So give, a, give our back issues a listen as well and let us know what you think. Okay. Sounds good. And you can reach me. Uh, best way to reach me is on Facebook. I'm there as Al Sussman. Uh, I've uh, I've deactivated Twitter for various and sundry reasons, and <laughs> which would be entirely too long to go into here. It's been cleaned but, up a uh, bit lately. Well, yes, it certainly has. There's been, <laughs> yes, there's been uh, one, uh, you know, one very, very significant uh, bit of cleanup, and uh, that's seventy-three percent cleanup. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> very true. But uh, this is that the, the best way is probably through Facebook or through Beetle Fan Magazine, uh, www.beetlefan.com. Uh, the uh, brand new issue of Beetle Fan uh, is uh, is out, <laughs> depending on the your particular post office situation. Mine took mine <laughs> took a little longer to reach me than normal. Mine too. But yeah, absolutely. I still and, don't have mine. Hmm. Really? I do oh, not have God. it. Ugh. And, uh, well, in, in the new issue, I have actually another... <laughs> I've been very busy the last uh, the last year or so, and I've got an, uh, the first of another another two part article this time on uh, basically examining how Beetle Fan covered the, the really the entire anthology project, beginning with the settling of the of the uh, the EMI lawsuits in uh, in 1989, and as a uh, a sidebar to that piece is a is a, a wonderful piece by Professor Cozen uh, on the interviews that he did during that time with Paul and Ringo and uh, Neil Aspinall and Derek, Derek Taylor. And all, and uh, because as I was going through the, as I was doing the research for the piece, and and was reading through the interviews, I said, "There's no way that I can do these justice by, you know, put doing three lines." So I suggested to Bill King that uh, we uh, convince Alan to do a uh, a sidebar, and it's a very good one, and it's in the in the brand new issue. Thank you. So, all right. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, this all happened in kind of uh, very short notice, as you can tell by my uh, by my rustiness. Uh, but it's uh, <laughs> but it's actually been it's actually been a lot of fun.
Again, this is uh, Al Sussman, uh, and uh, on behalf of, uh, of Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, thanks very much for listening to uh, the things we said today. And, um, well, Bill, see you next time. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.